Well, this is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm here again with another installment in our series on economics in one lesson. We're going chapter by chapter. And this morning we have Guido Hulsman, the author of uh, Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism. So it's a great pleasure to have you, Guido. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Jeffrey. And so we're talking this morning about how the price system works. And it's always occurred to me that this is the most underrated all, of all market institutions, the price system. Hardly anybody really understands it. And yet we use it every day, right? That is true, and uh, Hazlitt explains very well that it's not really, I mean, not only how prices work, but the interrelations that exist between prices, and in particular between industries. If one industry uh, flourishes, for each single industry, its uh, fate depends on the relationship between its, its cost expenditure and its selling receipts, uh -huh. which must be good. But precisely the, the crucial point is that both costs and selling receipts are interdependent with the costs and selling receipts of all other industries. How's that? So if one industry uh, flourishes, for example, because there's an additional consumer demand for it, so there's additional spending going on in this industry, so it can expand its activities, it means that consumers who spend more money on this must necessarily spend less money elsewhere in the economic system. So other industries experience a decrease in their selling receipts relative to cost expenditure, so their activity shrinks. It is, of course, possible to have general growth, the general growth of all industries, which results from savings, as Hazlitt explains in other chapters of his book. Right. But the crucial point is uh, that we, in order to pro properly understand the economic system, we always need to keep in mind the interdependencies that exist between all parts of the economic system and not just look on one part of it. Yes. Well, can you give us a definition of uh, the word price? What is a price? A price is an exchange ratio in which two quantities of, of goods are being uh, exchanged, and uh, one of them is money. Okay. And, uh, uh, and can we imagine a world without prices? Sure, we can imagine a world without prices. We can imagine a world of uh, individuals uh, living in isolation from one another and just caring for their own business, not cooperate with other people, never exchange a single bit. But of course, such a world could not be very populous because people would live in great misery, as we can understand. <laughs> if from, they live at all. <laughs> if they live at all. Yeah, well, in, in some particularly uh, well-endowed uh, areas, Africa, uh, Latin America, and so on, some parts of the United States where nature is generous and so on, there people could live off uh, just the fruits hanging on the trees and so on, so live a lot, uh, hand into the mouth existence. But uh, most other areas of the world where precisely Western civilization has emerged, uh, Europe, uh, Northern America, and so on, it would not be possible yeah. to live such a life. Uh, so any kind of extended or complicated form of human cooperation requires prices. It does require price, right? The only other logical alternative would be to imagine that we organize a division of labor by a central plan that has been tried out in the Soviet Union and its uh, satellites. And as uh, economic theory, Ludwig von Mises' theory has uh, explained and as ex historical experience has shown, this doesn't work. Who makes prices? People exchanging on the market. Every single one, you go to a bakery shop and pay a, a bread, uh, you create a price. Who, who creates a price? The consumer? It's the consumer and the seller. Uh -huh. So and the price is never just fixed by one person. Sometimes we say it's a colloquial way of uh, speaking. Uh, there's some price fixing on, going on by the companies, which means in practice that the companies say, well, we will not sell our commodity at any other price but this one. Uh -huh. But then, of course, that by itself does not yet give them uh, the opportunity to really exchange it. Only if they find customers who are willing to pay this, so who agree with this price, then it, the price comes into being. I could say, well, I set up a shoe factory and say, well, my shoes are so nice. I mean, their price is a million dollars. Okay, that's not yet a price. It's just a, it. a slip of paper that uh -huh. I attach to, to my shoes and it says one million dollars. Uh -huh. But that's not a price. Uh -huh. you know, a price comes into being once one appreciative gentleman, such as yourself, for example, uh -huh. 
pops into my shop and then actually gives me one million dollar uh -huh. for the shoes, okay. which I hope very much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so um, so the price is established in real exchange. It has to actually happen. Yes. Otherwise, it is what it's an offer or it's a. It's a just hot hot air. Hot air. Um, now, uh, I was at the bakery a couple of days ago, and there was a sign that said, um, look, we very much regret that we've had to go up slightly on our prices. And uh, I thought that was intriguing, um, because of course the bakery doesn't really want to go up on its prices. It wants more revenue, Yes. but it knows that any increase in price causes, exactly. causes fewer of its goods to be sold. Yeah, so you can interpret this... Uh uh, sign in, in various ways. They might actually regret themselves. We re regret ourselves very much to to have to increase our prices to still have a margin as compared to our cost. And then they cannot be sure that they still will have enough business to uh, create them some, some profit. Yeah. And uh, consumers, uh, of course, always and everywhere want to pay how much for all of their goods and services? Excuse me? How much do consumers want to pay? Well, we, we, we cannot generalize this. The, the fundamental fact is that consumers have to choose between different items right. that they would like to buy, shoes and clothing and uh, food stuff, and they have to pay for housing and so on. And the, the price that they are ready to pay for one any one item, of course, depends on the prices they yeah. have to pay for other things. Well, I recall being, I was once buying a, a car, and uh, this car salesman said to me, well, how much do you want to pay for this car? And my answer was, I, I mean, it was a very obvious answer, zero. Right? Good answer. <laughs> you might have reminded him of some essentials of economics. <laughs> I mean, and I was perfectly aware that he wanted to charge a billion dollars for this yes, car. You know, yes, so the, the yeah. problem was finding something in Yeah, between. so he had a good laugh and then you got to the matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, guess that, I guess that's it. Yeah. Now, um, what about this idea, um, or you'd already mentioned central planning, but why can't uh, uh, an agency um, set a price? Why can't, why can't uh, some external uh, third party uh, coercively just attach a price to a particular uh, good or service? Well, they, they, again, they can of course say, well, this object, this commodity may only be exchanged at this or that rate. Uh -huh. And you may call this a price. I think we have to, would have to make the distinction between a market price and a fiat price. Okay. okay. So why doesn't this work for all uh, goods? Well, uh, precisely because uh, all goods are interdependent with one another and um, their proper relationship cannot be determined by purely theoretical means. It's a very important insight that comes from Austrian economics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an engineering problem where we have a certain number of variables and then you plug this into a model and you, you get a certain result. I see. Because in human action, we have the fundamental problem of anticipating future conditions. Yeah. Most of our markets are not actually markets for consumer goods, right. but are markets for producer goods. So we're talking here about the cost side of production right. in a relation to consumer goods industries. But of course, uh, so the uh, producer goods markets are, let's say, 80% of the economy consumer goods markets are just about 20%. Yeah. Now, the prices for producer goods have to be determined in regard to what you expect to be the case in the future. Yes, right. So ultimately, it's a judgment that we have to make on the future. We do not have a scientific model that would allow us to predict or to determine exactly the future. Now, there are certain conventions, aren't mm. there, in the business world about what a price will be. Uh, you calculate all your costs and you figure mm. out what, what mm. kind of... Uh, mm. uh, uh, margin uh, revenue you need, mm -hmm. what kind of margin of revenue you need to mm -hmm. make this continue to be profitable, and you set it. And that's a convention, right? You can call it that way. It's, it's a, a practice that is uh, informed by business schools, for example, uh -huh. uh, standard teaching economics and so on. Or even just if you're just a regular businessman. You, you, yes, yeah. yes. But uh, again, uh, it's not accounting that gives you the, the proper price. Mm -hmm. Account is the other way around. Uh, the proper way to evaluate the assets that you have on your balance sheet is to first look what is the, the monetary value of the product that can be generated with the help of these assets yeah. in the future. Now this judgment is, judge, is just that. It's, it's a judgment. It's not something that results from a scientific inquiry. Right. But it's your good guess as an entrepreneur. It's your bet on the right. future. Now, precisely because we have no possibility to do this with a mathematical model, but yeah. because we have to bet, 
uh, we need uh, there's only one way to make this betting process responsible namely by creating property rights and by making sure that the consequences of a bad choice fall back on the, the person who yeah. makes it. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned fiat prices versus market prices. Yes. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, now, uh, if a government agency, for example, the post office, well, let's pick a different one. Um, let's say you have a, uh, uh, an agent, a housing agency mm. that's putting, it's building houses and putting them on the market. Mm. And they use what they consider to be a business convention to establish what their prices are. Mm -hmm. You know, they might, might observe, well, the housing industry tends to uh, buy things at this price and sell things at this price, so mm -hmm. we'll just do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're saying that that really ultimately is, a, is, is, is an arbitrary judgment. It's well, if, if, they, if they impose these supposed exchange, exchange ratios on yeah. the entire industry, whatever the particular conditions are, yes, that would be an improper way of handling it. And then what this. happens? Well, then we get to the, the chapter in, uh, which has the, deals with uh, price controls. Right? If the price is set arbitrarily at a level different from the level it would attain in the free market exchange uh -huh. economy, then you get surpluses and shortages. What is meant by this idea that all prices are past prices? Well, it means that uh, as long as we do not actually perform the exchange, we do not know what the price is. Uh -huh. So. And then, of course, as soon as, we, as soon as we know the price, well, it's a past price. We go to in the, in the bakery shop and you buy the bread for a dollar. Only once you've actually paid the price and got the, the bread, you know what the price for That's the history. bread is. And then it's, of course, already a past price. Yeah. Uh, let me mention also in this context that what businessmen are most concerned about is not necessarily the price. It's uh, the total selling proceeds and the total cost expenditure. Right. So we should not forget that, the, of course, the, the price is relevant because it determines also the quantities that are being uh, exchanged. What the businessman is mainly interested in is, is the volume generated as compared to the volume that he needs to right. expand. And this is true whether it's a medium-sized business, a huge business, or a lemonade stand. On the oh, we have right. a true economic principle. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing no matter what size the exactly. business is. Exactly. And uh, in this sense, uh, the bigger business has no real advantage, does it? No. Yeah. No. I mean, ultimately, it's just a matter of you're just adding more zeros onto the same problem, yes. which is trying yes. to make... The problem <laughs> is always to properly anticipate what is the total selling proceed that you can realize with a given investment. And then in relation to this, go on the market and try and see whether you can buy the factors of production necessary to bring this result about. Hire the proper workers, right. uh, rent the, the right... Uh, office space at the right location, and so on. Now, Hazlitt wrote this chapter, uh, 1946, which wasn't too many years, well, let's say it was before Hayek's work on prices, and it was after Mises' um, detailed work on economic calculation. So would you say um, that Hazlitt's um, presentation of these chapters um, is based uh, on a Misesian perspective of, of prices? Hayek published his famous article on the use of knowledge in society in 1945, which okay. was a year before the publication, okay. first publication of Hazlitt's yeah. essay. So you could say that this might have had an impact, especially since he knew, of course, Hayek, yes. at least by correspondence. Hayek actually did come to the U.S. for the first time in 1945, I believe, uh -huh. to promote his book, The, the Road to Serfdom, uh, yeah. or in 1946, I don't remember very well. Uh -huh. So, I mean, their personal context was, uh, uh, contact was not very frequent, not very uh -huh. strong. So probably Mises had a, a much more definite impact on his thinking. Again, if you look at this chapter, how price determines uh, the economy, it, it's very Bimbaverkian, right? Uh -huh. so the great subject of Bimbaverk's uh, capital and interest, a great treatise, capital and interest, yeah. in which he stresses this point. The great contribution of Bimbaverk to Austrian economics was to create uh, an analysis of the economy as a whole. Karl Menger had just analyzed the process of price formation for individual prices and talked not very much about the relationships between different prices. That was the great contribution of Bimbaverk's and Mises was, of course, the most important disciple of, of Bimbaverk, and you find 
these central ideas reflected in all of his works. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So you would say that the has has chapter here is more Bumbaverkian. Bimba, it's very Bumbaverkian. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's great. And of course, that's a fundamental contribution of Austrian economics that is unfortunately totally neglected by the mainstream today, was not neglected in the early 20th century when Bumbabek was still widely read among economists all over the world. But unfortunately now with this an unfortunate uh, concentration on partial equilibrium analysis or the unilateral focus on individual prices, individual industries, this whole message gets lost. What about uh, the next chapter? We're talking about stabilizing commodities. It's a subject that becomes, again, of great importance in our day. We only need to think of the oil industry and uh, the, the rants against the speculators on the market. It's, it's an eternal subject. You know what the most important field of literature was in economic literature up to 1850, say? What the most important economic policy problem was? Declining prices? No, it was wheat, the wheat, the wheat. market. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, and uh, how to stabilize the wheat price and could the market do it or not. Mm -hmm. This was about 40% of all economic writings concerned oh, this problem. So that's very, very interesting yeah. because I don't know if you've had a chance to pick up um, this, and you, I highly recommend it, this Garrett, Garrett novel called Satan's Bushel. I, no, I do not yeah, take Which deals it. entirely with yeah. the whole wheat problem. But you do get the sense when you're reading that, that wow, this wheat stuff, is, this wheat problem is a big deal because, yes. because farmers felt like they couldn't really make, yes. it, make a living or they'd try to sell at a high price. But since they all sold at once, then the market would be flooded and the prices would go down. Yeah, and uh, so they're trapped by the market, and the government, government needs to protect them. And and did you need loan loan programs that allow the poor farmers to hold back their their wheat and sell it in a more a proper point of time, and so on. And All there were these wheat ideas, cartels, like the farmers were trying to yes. get together, but there was yes. always an, invariably one or two uh, that would. Uh, break the price by secretly adding their bushels to the market. Yes, and it, it is really not necessarily to the, it's, it might be to the advantage of the sub-marginal, that is to the inefficient producers, but it's never in the interest of the efficient producers and of the consumer. Yeah. Well, the Garrett uh, book deals specifically with the advent of futures markets as, as the uh, way to deal with, uh, with the price problems. Yeah. But um, what has its argument is that uh, that uh, stabilizing prices is not really, stable prices is not an ideal that we want to try to seek to achieve, right? Yes, because prices should, of course, reflect the changing conditions on the market. If you have one uh, market segment that becomes increasingly important, let's say now the computer industry in, yeah. in the past 25 years, then you do not want to keep the prices where they were in 1980. They should reflect the ongoing changes in the volume of demand, for example, and the type of good that is being offered there. But the general perception is that we can't permit an industry that's absolutely critical to the overall economic, macroeconomic structure to just uh, go through some sort of enormous upheaval suddenly, for yes. example, housing, because that mm. will drag the economy down with it. Mm. Well, that's, of course, uh, it's precisely the opposite, around, the opposite way around. The more important an industry is, the more important it is that prices be flexible. And of course, we should not forget, and that's a point that is also stressed by Hazlitt, that uh, the, the question how important a good is, is not liable to find a general answer. It is answered for, by each indi individual, each household, differently. So each household needs to be determined how much money do I want to spend, on housing, how much money do I want to spend on food, and so on. We, we cannot uh, say this, I mean, your budget should be 30% in housing, and then 20% on food and various other items. There are people who have completely different preferences. I always think in this context of a good friend of mine uh, during my university years when I was a student, and so you're very, we were all very poor, of course, and some of them, they, they spend 50% of their budget on theater tickets. So what do you do about this? Do you want to impose on them and say, well, you've got to spend 50% on housing, you have to have a better apartment. They were living in a, in a, in a, in a very shabby place. But yeah, they accepted this. There was, were more important things for them to, to buy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this underscores the absurdity of uh, something like, uh, speaking of a price level for the whole economy, doesn't it? Well, what is important for the functioning of an economy is not the level of prices. Of course, we can always construe 
a mathematical average of all prices. And that's uh -huh. possible. You can observe uh, the evolution of this aggregate of this basket throughout time. That uh -huh. is possible. Uh -huh. But what is important for the functioning of, of the economy, for its operation, are the relations between prices and, again, more precisely, the relations between spending streams. Yes. An industry flourishes not if the price level is high. An industry flourishes if the level at which it has its selling receipts is superior to the level of ex cost expenditure, whatever the segment of the economy. Yeah. Therefore, an economy can function very well at a high level of expenditure, at a low level of expenditure, at an increasing level of expenditure and at a decreasing level of expenditure. It never matters what the level is. It always matters only is there a positive spread between selling prices and buying prices. And that prices. requires absolute freedom of, of, of adjustment of prices. And precisely if you have variations, yeah. if you have uh, systematic changes, increases of the price level, for example, and decreases, the market must be free yeah. in order to adjust to this. And so there are many markets, probably... I don't know, fewer, it seems, than in the past, in which uh, the government fixes the price. Uh, maybe this is more common in France than in the U.S. It seems like price fixing is not so much practiced in this country, except for the government-provided goods and services. Yes. You know? but of course, you have, you have rent control and things like that. And, and it is not important today, in 2008, as it has been, say, in 1975. Yeah. So in those days, of course, we had uh, very high inflation rates. And in America, you had the Nixon administration yeah. imposing a system it, of it price and rent control. It, 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 can, it always is. Yeah. Th bad things are always tried out again and again. Right. right. So they, what Hegel, the German philosopher, once said, the only thing that you learn from history is that you never learn from history. <laughs> People never learn from history. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, also the importance of uh, theoretical instruction, good economic training, because yeah. it's the principles yeah. that allow us to orient ourselves whatever, in a changing historical context. And there are, of course, always the emergency um, situations where the politicians uh, threaten uh, price controls and then don't actually impose them. And intimidate producers. Have you seen this? Yes. And intimidate. It constantly goes on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. People to, to lower their prices. Or to raise the prices. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it happens well, to be. But the F effect is actually the same. Uh -huh. To the extent that they take this serious, it has yeah. very similar effects to an actual price control. Yeah, so that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so this goes on all the time. And even, um, I, I've wondered in the past how this affects uh, certain markets, it's just the prospect that there will be investigations, or prospect that there'll be, uh, for example, bad press, you know, can have an impact. Oh, yes. Yeah, for, for, for Especially on financial markets, for yeah. example. And therefore... Uh, our government, both here in the U.S. And, and in Europe, our governments try to massage the news. Yeah. So they have uh, public relations agencies their own, and they also hire uh, private public relationships to produce good news about capital markets yeah, in particular. Yeah, prices going this yes. way or that way. Yeah. But we, we do have odd views, don't we, around, about prices. We carry around this view, for example, in the United States. Everybody's convinced that, oil, uh, that the price of oil must be should be far lower than it is. Mm. But the price of uh, housing should be far higher than it is. Yes. You know? yeah. And uh, we just carry around these views with us without, yeah. without much thought yes. as, to, as to what it implies and just how arbitrary this is. Why is it that the price of oil should be lower? Well, from a psychological point of view, of course, it's, it's understandable. Everybody wants to sell at a high price and buy at very low prices. Yeah. So we would like to have the oil price to be low because it allows us to drive very large and all gas-consuming cars, and we would like to have the housing price very high because our wealth increases with it and so on. It's, it's understandable. And we had a situation in the past uh, six or seven years uh, in which precisely this happened. Housing went up and uh, gas prices stayed fairly, uh, fairly stable uh, level. So there is a temptation for people to think that's the normal state of affairs. And right. It should always be that, that way. Well, but uh, things are not always uh, that way. And in fact, from the point of view of Austrian economic analysis, the, this situation was rather illusory. It was an artificial result of uh, government interventionism in the economy that created a wrong impression for, uh, for people. And led to some degree of malinvestment. Led to, certainly to too much investment in the, in the housing market, yeah. too much consumption, because yeah. people believed that the 
increase of uh, their housing value would be permanent, so they were taking out equity uh, to pay for the un university fees of their children, buy a new car, spend a nice vacation, and so on. Yeah. And therefore actually were uh, consuming their capital and destroying wealth. Now, one of the things that seems to be missing from these chapters that you would normally find in a regular economics text is uh, uh, some kind of graphical analysis. Uh, this is just words. Yes. Do you think that um, that the, that the exposition uh, suffers any f for its lack of? Uh... Not in the slightest. Okay. I believe that it's, it's slightly irritating for those who have economic training today because they're precisely used to be confronted with graphical exposition in mm -hmm. economic textbooks and in economic uh, ex explanation. But for all others who come from other strands of life, no, I don't think so at all. Yeah. They, they orient themselves perfectly and for them it's actually more difficult to find themselves, to orient themselves in a, in a diagram. Right. And Hazlitt's writing is, is a narrative. Crystal it's clear and relentless rigorous. Too, yes. It? Yeah. yeah. Just step by step. Yes. yes. Yeah. And it shows precisely, yeah, we, we, do not know, we do not really need this. Think, for example, of the typical exposition of uh, price control in a neoclassical or mainstream textbook. Mm -hmm. It first of all illustrates a, an equilibrium situation on the housing market, for example, and then says, now let's suppose the government fixes the price below the equilibrium price. And then you can show with demand curves and supply curves that there is a non-intersection between the two curves at this point, so uh, demand is higher than, than supply, and you call this then a shortage. Very fine. Now, strictly speaking, that's not correct, because on the, the market is actually never in general equilibrium in any single individual market is virtually never an equilibrium. So the proper way to present the economic, economic law, the principle that is here at stake, is to say a price control has these consequences if it fixes the price below what the market would have established, irrespective of the question whether the market is in equilibrium or not. Yeah. You see, so Hazlitt is actually more accurate. Yeah. In stating the economic principle, then you could do it with a graphical, the standard graphical exposition. And here he follows J.B. Say, doesn't he? Yes, and doesn't well, previous yeah. uh, economists. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Guido, for your wonderful. Great pleasure to be with you today. Yeah.